Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring the topics of music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. My, uh, my Logic Pro template, I feel proud that I have one for recording episodes, but then like little, I keep making the same little tweaks to it and not overwriting the original template. So it's like I go through this little dance every time I've got all half of it set up for me, but then I have to lengthen the project. I have to turn off the count off for the record button because I forgot to do that before I saved the template. I'm impressed you have a template. It's not even very complicated. It's usually just, um, it just has one audio track that's set to record my microphone's input. But the point of the template is to avoid exactly this dance. Right. Every time, but I, I keep doing it. Yep. And it's that process of you have to remember to create the template and then keep on editing it and then actually use it the next time. Right. Well, and I just don't know how to overwrite one. I don't want to make one. I don't know how to overwrite one. I guess you just do it the same way and then it asks if you want to try, like, copy, uh, make a second copy or uh, rewrite the original file. I would assume so. Yeah. Um, so you guys are all on uh, quarantine as well. Yeah, what's everyone's status on that? Do we have state orders in all three? We finally got yeah. ours on Monday, so we're good here. Is it is it, is it an official uh, stay-at-home order? Well, except for the essential people, and they are charging, like, really they could like give out a $1,000 civil fine, but there's no cops stopping anybody and checking anybody, so it's kind of like just a scare tactic right now. So, yeah, we're all stay-at-home essentials, and then we have to start some sort of online learning uh, time with our cl- kids so but it's pretty minimal at our school they're pretty laid back because not we're not one-to-one so same for us yeah we've got in maryland we have a it's a five thousand dollar fine i don't know what's stopping fr- someone from saying like if you're just dri- driving around cruising if you get pulled over just to say oh i'm going to the grocery store um but you know other than that you can go for a nice walk uh those are the only two reasons we've been out of the house but um, we do have, yeah, we are starting online learning. Our, we officially went back to work last Monday, but online learning is the, the first week where we give anything that's technically called an assignment is April 20th. All right. What have you been doing, Chris? Well, we uh, had um, a weird situation. We had spring break, and then they extended our spring break by a day or two and then brought the staff back. And then later that week, the governor of Minnesota basically – issued a decree that that um, all schools were suspended so teachers could plan for distance learning. And then we all started distance learning on the 30th of March. So we're in week two of this, I think, right now. So you have a jump, head jump on us then. Yeah, but it sounds like some, like, for example, where my, my kids live, we live right over the border in Wisconsin, and they had um, school all week and then suddenly at the end of that week just wisconsin said that's it we're done and the teachers there had no planning time and sent the kids home with a packet of stuff and then they had their spring break for a week so they had two days of distance learning for like the start with no prep time then a week off and then they were back in it this week and i think last week too so it's been pretty crazy here I can imagine the outcry from teachers in those circumstances. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing things in the state of Maryland, and we've had weeks of very, very slow unfolding tech support and meetings and things, you know, and, all, and, and there's still tons of people who are very dissatisfied with how it's been communicated, although you could argue that it's being communicated as best could be in this situation. But I can't imagine being – well, I, I can imagine being personally – confused but fine like being thrown into e-learning the next week like i would have the resources and the skills to do it i would not think it was the best decision but uh i mean we have teachers who have never made a video yes in our district before absolutely and that's that's where i'm pretty comfortable because of all the youtube stuff i've done in the last three years i just kind of picked up with what i was doing and trying to make as much of my normal class as i could and now that i'm teaching elementary that's a little different ball game but I tried to, to try to keep the same format of my class with the videos that I'm making. So all these other teachers are starting off with like, 
here's a five minute video and a two second activity for you to do at home where I'm kind of like trying to use my own skills to keep some normalcy in kids' life and also keep the parents from going crazy. Because one of the things we notice with our own kids is that when they're bringing home the work from school, and again, I'm not in the same district where I, I teach, but we're helping or my wife is helping if I'm working um, our boys all the time with questions. And I just want to make it as plug and play as possible for the parents so that they're not having to micromanage their kids too. And I'm sure they appreciate that. I hope they know that that's what I'm doing. I haven't really said much about it. I'm just doing it. <laughs> yeah, I think we're in the same boat. We're trying to not, I mean, because that's one of the things that I think gives me a level of comfort with teaching online is the first thing is that I, I know some tools, got a lot of tools that I know how yep. to use. But the equally important thing, if not more important, is that I am not looking for ways to reinvent my profession like it should to me it should stay as close to what it was as it can and like a band rehearsal we we are not going to have anything close to what a band rehearsal is again this year and i and i think there's a lot of people who are like how do i do a digital like a virtual band and knit the videos together or a virtual choir or orchestra and i'm just accepting that that's not something that's like i might kind of fiddle with some of that just for fun I'm not going to tell anyone I'm going to do it. And then, because I don't think I actually have the time or the grit yeah. <laughs> to knit it together. But I, I'm, I just think like, you know, we are fortunate at my school that we already had our, you know, there's the band rehearsal with the concert music, but then in our pullout sectionals, we have a very individual skill-based curriculum that our students work through. And that's already a curriculum that has musical excerpts that we've posted on our website. And the only difference that a student really needs to do is instead of playing those assessments for us in person, now they're going to just upload video. So while there's, it's not quite as simple as that. I mean, we have some kids who didn't bring instruments home, some who have varying degrees of skill uploading and recording video. Like the, the bottom line is that we're not changing where our resources are, what our curriculum is, where to find stuff. We're really just switching to like the, rec the recording of the videos is the only skill that didn't previously need to be there that now will have to be there for our students yeah there's a lot of people that have been asking that question well how can we do an online rehearsal with everybody and it just keeps getting asked again and again have you guys seen there there is a uh, like a youtube video out where four guys have tried to do like a zoom live audio and it's just hilarious the the, send me it i'll put it in together. the show notes maybe as a way to <laughs> send the, the message to anyone listening i mean I keep getting asked. I actually had to, and I, and I try to. I have to try to exercise some empathy with the way I say this. But <laughs> like it, it is a little frustrating to like. I'm not really a fan of Facebook to begin with, but you know, I'm a little. I got a little more time lately, so I've been on it more out of sheer boredom. And uh, I had to. I just had to stop because I couldn't. Like the algorithm lately really prefers that you see the content of groups that you're a member of over friends that you have. So, I mean, between the band directors, the music teachers, and the online learning, music teachers creating online learning content, Facebook groups, I mean, I'm every other post I'm seeing is, how do I do a digital band? What are the best voice chat apps? How do I, what microphone do I need? And I'm like, honestly, you can't do an online band. You don't really need a fancy microphone. And nope. just use the voice chat app that's already on your phone, and you're done. <laughs> like, Yep. That's what works for me, though, is the simplest, like the the most direct path from point A to point B. Katie Wardrobe had a great post. Um, I don't know if you saw her blog post, but um, she thought she was being mean, which I don't I don't think Katie has it within her to to actually be mean <laughs> in, in that context. But she's basically her response was for all of you people wanting to make, uh, you know, one of these Eric Whitaker choirs, which he did this, what, almost 10 years ago. Right. So, you know, he really blazed the way of that. She's like, it, you just don't have the time or resources. Although I did see on Facebook talking again about Facebook is I saw an ad for a company that's willing to put together the video. If you provide the track and everything for fifteen dollars a person in the recording, a person, fifteen dollars a person, because there was one that I saw is like fifteen hundred dollars, like fifteen hundred dollars total and kept moving. Okay. You'll have to give us that link. 
Well, if you've got a 65 to 70, or in, I have some colleagues who have 90 person bands. I mean, you're getting close to 1,000, 1,500 already, yep. uh, even at 15 a kid. And I just, I would never pay that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's not worth it. But I think Robbie hit the nail on the head. It kind of opens up the door for us now to, we're being mandated to do some sort of contact with the kids. And of course, in my situation, we can't do it online and mandate it uh, that they actually turn something in, but we can only hope that they turn something in. We can offer those resources and hopefully we get some one-to-one contact with kids, sending us some recordings that we can then give them some feedback on. I'll tell you the natural outcome of all this is that I think we're going to see a nationwide surge in one-to-one programs after this. I believe it. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, this this is exposing and proving so many things about everything, not just education. I mean, hopefully, I was just thinking today, this has nothing to do with what you just said, but hopefully it proves that you don't really need to have an in-person staff meeting to get things done. That's one thing that's been proven to me this week. But you're you're right, though. It's like when you get desperate, you start to think about how to make things work maybe more efficiently than you did before. I I know our district is buying tens of thousands of Chromebooks and they're on back order for, I don't think some of them are going to be in students' hands until the end of May, June. Everyone's doing the same thing, but maybe there's a lesson to be learned there. Maybe, you know, if we can, because I mean, let me just, should we take a bet? Like how, when do you all think we're going back to school? I'm hearing (laughs) such a wide range. Yeah. We start after Labor Day in Minnesota and Wisconsin. So generally, so I'm, I'm imagining that we be back after Labor Day. But then again, they're talking about another surge of cases once we all start hanging out together again. Oh, geez. I haven't heard that one. Right. It's so hard to say. I mean, I guess we're going to at a certain point, like I, I'm the same way in our district. We are having very light expectations for the students work, at least at first. But it's not going to stay that way forever if we're still out of school, you know, in September of next year. So I would like to think if you look at that plus this increased vigor to get technology in students' hands, then maybe, yeah, there will be some rethinking to how we equip students long term. If we're still out of school in the fall, they're going to have to require everyone to have access like that and that the assignments are actually graded. Yeah, I agree. I, and I think that for that to happen, you're going to have to move from a really quick term solution to a problem to at least a medium term solution where you're thinking about every student. Like right now, we are to get by, we're doubling up some computers and families and, um, you know, teachers are staggering their check in times asynchronously so that, you know, everyone in the family can coordinate with their teacher when their student can check in if they need to. So, yeah, I mean, at a certain point, you got to say, hey, every everyone needs at least a computer and you know that computer has to at least meet these kinds of specifications chris when you were one to one did you could a could a family opt to provide their own device and if so did it have to meet certain requirements no when i was at our one to one programs we provide the dice device for every family and they just use that and they are provisioned by the school district and they have a proxy that the st- that the device is forced to, that it clears through our filters before it goes to the internet. And that solved a lot of problems too. So nobody could buy their own device. See, I wonder now, even if that, because I understand security is there for a reason, but there are so many unnecessary and ridiculous security constraints on technology and the school system that I wonder if this does not also call into question some of those and maybe just a little bit of a lightening of that down the road. Like, for example, there's music technology online, like some of the really popular web apps, Smart Music and Music First, where we are not allowed to integrate those to our learning management system because they don't work with this one particular protocol called Clever that integrates single sign-on. Like, do we rethink that if in October the general music teachers are saying, like, we're running out of content. (laughs) We can't, you know what I mean? (laughs) I don't know. Well, We'll have to see, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right. When people get desperate, all sorts of things start to get rethought. One of the other things that I've learned through this process of being a, a former secondary teacher and now being elementary is how 
much of the online material is geared towards older students and maybe even collegiate students ultimately in the long run. Um, Note flight um, is not necessarily elementary friendly. I know some people are using it, but I, I it's it's too hard to to get that going with your kids if they've never used it and you haven't been one to one in your classroom in the first place. So and by the way, wonderful that all these programs like Note Flight and what are some of the others that are offering the free subscriptions until the end basically of the school year. But still there's there's some real problems. The uh, music first, that whole thing is really geared towards secondary students more than elementary students. There are some parts that are okay, but that's also not included with the free stuff that they're giving out right now. And it's a whole lot different to get an elementary school student onto something like Note Flight or Flat uh, versus a high school student. I mean, there's, yeah, you're right. If we want an elementary school aged student to be asking, online music notation stuff there needs to be a rethink in the way it's designed well in, in our district and and don't quote me on this because um i haven't been sitting in the meetings but just from a little bit of the picture i'm putting together from my colleagues it seems like they're starting off even with lighter expectations like there's only allowed to be instructional videos published and then the content of those videos is primarily review so in other words you don't teach new content at least yet. So if you're like, I'm just thinking about a fourth grade clarinet player who maybe knows five, six notes right now, you know, I mean, what do you, what do you do? I guess you have to do the best you can. I mean, I can think, I can think of tons of things you can do. It's just, right. it's just rough. This, this is like the important part of the year. If you are developing technical skill in a performing ensemble, it's like where you start. To, yeah, go ahead. Well, we've spent, We've spent the we've spent the whole first part of the year trying to get them to produce a decent tone, and now is the point in, in the band world, you know, with those beginners where we're really starting to get the ball rolling fast, and like you said, going beyond those first five six notes. And yeah, how do they do that at home by themselves? What music's available for them? I mean, of course, my kids have it, their method books, and if they have the desire to learn, they're they can go on and in their method books. But That's the question, right? So I, just to clarify, do it sounds like neither of you have graded assignments for the time being. Well, our district has, we have changed gears in our district. We've decided that there is going to be no, now I can only speak elementary, there are going to be no report cards for this end part of the year. Um, and the only thing that they're really tracking is attendance or involvement in, in school. And then they're also telling students that and parents that if they're overwhelmed by the stuff that their teachers are giving them to do the specialists last or not at all. So, you know, so it, if you don't get a kid doing any of your music stuff, there's really nothing you're going to do about that. But we're definitely not grading. But we've we've been standards based in our elementary programs now for about two or three years where we, we grade on standards rather than a, a grade grade anyway. So that's different than secondary, too. Hmm. Yeah, our schools, our state funding is basically relying on have we made contact with our students in some way, shape, or form. So we're doing some of the Zoom meetings, phone calls, emails, and we're documenting all that stuff. It's not, it's not content-based. We're basically doing a well, you know, are you okay at home? How are you handling all this stuff? And, and I'm, oh yeah, I'm actually way, okay with that from this perspective. Out. Our sectional skill-based curriculum I was talking about a second ago is sequenced in a way where our students can make progress through it based on how many, we, we call them stars, but they're really points that they get on each assignment. Um, every assignment has a five-point rubric. And basically, once you get 21 out of 25 stars on the first five songs, you elevate to the next packet of music so you're, you're kind of like going through and I, you know i've gamified it you get a colorful ribbon every time you advance a packet you can tie it on your instrument case but this system ultimately helps us decide things like seating and like placement for which students are in which ensembles every year so even though i'm not going to be at the end of the quarter putting in a grade of how many stars they earned they can still make progress through our curriculum and we can still get all of those other benefits that we need like there's still 
the advancing. There's still moving ahead, helping us to get our ensembles put together for next year. So it's kind of, I guess it's lucky that we structured it that way, but I'm not intending to grade anything other than did you or did you not submit the video? And even then, not submitting the video is not weighted. Like it's pass fail, but fail is really excused. Right. So what else is new? Well, did you see the announcement from uh, Smart Music that they're allowing music sharing now? I know very little bit about it, but I watched, I read the blog today from Smart Music and I saw the announcement come out. So uh, Smart Music can now be used as a way to distribute and share music with others. I don't know all the details there yet. Um, I don't know how they're going to deal with people that upload you know, copyrighted works that they've scanned, perhaps, or whatever. But the idea is that that smart music now has the potential to be used as a sheet or as a music sharing site with people that you want to as well. Music that you have composed, kind of like Note Flight, to a user forum, or music that is in the library. It it's music that you have created. You can upload to smart music and you can share it with a select group of people. So it's a little different than the marketplace. So it's not a, you can buy my music at smart music, but a way to distribute music that you've put in, I think specifically through finale, but also like you can import music XML, but I just haven't used smart music in the recent past, both at the middle school and now at the elementary level. So, um, I really don't know how it looks or what it works, but all I know is that they made a big announcement about it today. So it sounds like what you're saying is you can, if something's not in their library and you happen to have an XML file for it, you can upload concert literature and organize it and distribute it to your students much in the same way that your other concert music may have been right. distributed. I think that's now I, th- I thought you maybe could already do that or I knew that it was coming. But that's interesting because pra- something like Practice First, which is not quite the library as smart music, but is the same idea of you record yourself playing a thing and it analyzes the accuracy of the notes and rhythms, that you can import an XML file into already. Am I right? With pract- pra- yeah, Practice First, which is specifically the music first offering that does the same thing smart music With does. music first? I don't know. It, but smart music is the one that has the biggest library of all of these different music analysis tools. Yeah, I don't um, use that one, and so I, I figure, you know, like when you pay for smart music, that's really what you're paying for is not just the technology, but the, the, the library. Um, I did sign up for a free account when they started offering them a month ago. I can't technically use it because it's not integrated with Clever, though what I could do is create some free usernames and send, give them to my students and say, hey, you can use this as a resource. About four of our six band tunes that I pass out before we left are up here and it's a tool for you, but I can't actually use it as a learning platform. It looks like you may even be able to share with people that aren't even using smart music somehow. I, I, again, I don't know how this totally works yet, but I know they, yesterday at 301, they sent out a email promo thing about it. So. All right, I'll do some more research. I'll put some links to some of their publications in the show notes to this episode. Anything else uh, new going on with you? I know there's one major topic we're definitely going to talk about today, but are there other interesting things going on with you all technologically? Any things you're trying new, either as a result of this crisis or not as a result? Hey, with our church worship team, we're doing one of those, well, okay, we're doing four or five of those virtual choir things that we were talking about. And just for the fun of it this week, I decided to do all the audio mixing on my iPad which is the 12 inch <laughs> generation one. And I, uh, I broke it. I mean, like I found like the limits of Cubasis. <laughs> I've now decided I need to upgrade because it can't handle all the processing. When I started throwing in the plugins and the, the reverb and the noise cancellation and stuff. Yeah. I broke it like 12 tracks of stuff. And really I didn't have that much processing on things, but the noise reduction apps and it was amazing the quality you know we mentioned this earlier we have like i don't know eight ten people that are submitting tracks and of course there's only two of us with any kind of professional recording gear and uh so everyone's just using their phones and it actually sounds halfway decent actually it sounds more than halfway decent (laughs) 
And it's See, amazing to me that I could yeah, do all the audio fun. mixing. Well, it's interesting. On my that I that I actually kind of does logic to do tie it. in a little bit to our big topic that we're going to get to later because um, it's just kind of fun. Wh- which iPad are you using? The the newer of the iPad Pros or the? Because I think some of the iPad Pros of the newer, not the one that just came out last month, but of the newer styling with like the new keyboard cover and the Apple Pencil 2. I was using my 12-inch Gen 1 iPad Pro, so it's a few years old. Some of those have um, six gigs of RAM in them. Yeah, and I've I've got one sitting here. It's my, my band director one, and I need to, but I don't have those apps on that iPad yet, so I haven't bump them over to see if it'll i'm sure it'd handle it but my the gen one would not <laughs> so so you make me mentioning q um any any mention of pro audio software on the ipad makes me want to ask have you all played with the new cursor support in ios 13.4 not yet it's pretty fun i've got a magic trackpad too that i use at my desktop and i bluetooth that to my ipad and yeah i think they really nailed it yeah i like the cursor the way it changes depending on what you're over and such. Yeah. I had to give my iPad keyboard to my son to use with his iPad so that he can do his work on his iPad. So I've got a new uh, keyboard that should be arriving this week. And when you order something now on Amazon, if it's a non-essential item, sometimes it's taking two to three weeks to get things. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. My son ordered a bed. It won't be here till May. (laughs) And they're moving out, finding the new house, and he doesn't have a bed to sleep on. <laughs> He's got the frame, but not nothing else. So yeah, non-essential. But yeah, the the mouse stuff, Chris. Don't you have a Bluetooth mouse you can hook up? I do, but I had to give that to my son too. Ah, yeah. Bummer. Yeah. <laughs> I think that it's it's one of these things where, in the way that Apple sometimes is, when they really nail the hardware design i think it's a lot of little nice touches together that make the experience of it really good and i think they've really nailed like from using the magic trackpad it's clear that they've done a lot of high quality work with the software but i think it's going to be having an actual trackpad built into the keyboard case that's going to like make it the ultimate convenience in design do you know what i mean like i like the whole point of having the ipad is that it's so easy to lug around right uh and, and the point of having the trackpad is obviously for that fine precision well you take away the convenience when i'm dragging my magic trackpad too around the house with me on top of my ipad yep but it's uh it's really well thought out and it really um it's obvious that it hasn't become as fully integrated into the ipad as it could yet but there are some nice little touches like in garage band if you drag outside of a bunch of regions like you would on the Mac, and so if you click and drag from outside a region, you can actually do the select multiple regions right. gesture that you until now could only do with a keyboard and a mouse or a trackpad on the Mac. So that felt pretty powerful. That made me feel like, okay, logic for the iPad has got to be in the well, works. Well, actually, speaking about that multi-select, usually if you keep your finger down and touch something, and then touch additional things, other things select. I think that's always been part of iOS. Yeah, it is in some cases, but I cannot figure out, and if anyone knows how to do it, I'd love to know, how to get basically the uh, same, in GarageBand on iPad, the same effect that you would get on the Mac if you held the command key and clicked. Like, I want to just highlight a bunch of different regions that are not necessarily in order of one another. Uh, Can't figure that out. Command tap doesn't work command and clicking using the new trackpad support doesn't work maybe they just haven't baked it in yet well and i think some of that stuff just has to be on a app or an individual app basis it needs graded because when um like in four score you know i can drag things and i can start dragging one item and then add more items to it but in cubasis three i can't do that at all i have to drag one at a time well, because if you use a lot of the uh, Apple's custom view controls in your app, like you know the back buttons and the the toolbars and the you know all this all the same UI stuff that Apple provides to a developer as part of their development kit, you get a lot of the automatic trackpad support already because you've basically followed the rules. But if you're someone like Google, like all the Google apps are custom code and user interface, so all of them act just like. The tap is the click with the trackpad is just like a tap on the screen. There's no 
fancy extra stuff that you can do. But it's interesting, though, with something like Fourscore, because Fourscore is the kind of app where even though they do use a lot of iOS stuff in their app and they get a couple of those benefits, there's also weird things. Like, what would you, if you were on the Mac, let's just say, and I, I would really love for there to be a Fourscore app on the Mac, let's just say that. If you were on the Mac and you were looking at a Fourscore document, how would you expect a mouse or a trackpad to turn the page of your document? A mouse? Yeah, a click on the right-hand side or left side. Single click, maybe? Really? Okay, so for me, I would think the same thing like what the iBooks app would do where you would swipe gesture to turn the page with the mouse or the trackpad. Well, if you have a trackpad, that would make sense. But if I just have a mouse, that doesn't make any sense at all. See, that's funny to me because I don't, I don't like the swipe gesture at all for turning pages. Huh, interesting. Okay, because obviously in Fourscore, with the new trackpad support, you click in the same places that she would tap to turn the pages, the right or the left side of the screen. And for me, I'm like, I've got my fingers right on this thing. I just want to drag. See, I don't like the swipe because it's more involved than a tap. And I, I'm i the same way. I'm kind of a lot of times, all I have time to do is reach up and go, boom, and then hope it turns. Huh. All right. I guess everyone's different. And I even, I even turned that off. I turned that off in iBooks, and I turned that off on... Uh, I think I did, too. Or if, I don't know if I turned it off, but it works where you can... So, oh, so you iBooks, can't even swipe the, the page on Fourscore and turn the page. As an option. It's tap only. Right now, yeah, because I don't like that gesture. Yeah. Yeah. But now, back to your original uh, uh, question you mentioned a minute ago, Robbie, you would want for on your Mac. Isn't there in, uh, what is it? Catalina, can't we do that pretty soon? Or does Fourscore have to do something first? They do. So yeah, there's this thing called a Catalyst app, which Apple released on stage at WWDC, their developer conference last spring. And it allows developers who make iPad apps to take the same code and turn it pretty easily into a Mac app. I mean, they say you just check a box, but you've obviously got to do a lot of work to make it function correctly. And then you've got to do even more work to get it to feel like it's an app that actually belongs on the Mac. Like for example, I've got Good Notes on my Mac now and they're using that same feature where you port your iPad app. And they've done, I think, as nice a job as you should expect anyone to do. But there are clear ways where it still feels like you're using an iPad app. Like for example, you single tap on a document instead of a double click to open one, which feels a little weird compared to the Finder. Yep. Um, the user interface has those back and forward buttons with little arrows rather than actual inset buttons. So it's it's a little it's a little odd. And you know you can go to however many lengths you want. But the bottom line is, yeah, it's way 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 easier for a developer to make a Mac app if they've got one on the iOS App Store. Um, I would suspect that there are two things that would keep something like Fourscore from existing yet. One is that they probably want to do it right. And two, actually, there are three things. They first of all, they probably want to do it right. Second of all, I would suspect that they need, like, there's an iOS version of Fourscore for the phone, but your documents don't sync over iCloud at all. So you've got to basically maintain two separate libraries. I'm not really going to use Fourscore on my iPhone as a dominant device, but if it synced my library I've put so many hours into on the iPad, there are times where I would definitely take it out of my pocket and, like, look at a little detail of a score for just a hot second and then put my phone away. But because there's no syncing. I'm not very motivated to do that. So I would think they would need to find a way to sync a database because you're not, no one is going to want to open up Fourscore on their brand new iMac Pro and see like none of the files that they've spent years and years and years working with on the iPad. So that'd be two. And then three, I think, is that Apple, that same developer conference announced another way to use one type of one code base and make not only an iPad and a Mac app, but an iPhone and an Apple Watch and an Apple TV app using the same code. And it's called Swift UI. And it's in the really early stages. But if I'm a developer, I'm probably thinking to myself, okay, I could do this Catalyst thing, which will get my app to the App Store quicker on the Mac, or I could wait for more details about Swift UI and put in the work for the longer term process. Anyway, that was a long rant, but that's why I suspect we don't have it yet. Or they just don't want to. Gotcha. Well, and I agree with the fact that they need to be able to sync the libraries. That's just a given. How do we get on that? Oh, right. Trackpad support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fine. 
Rabbit That's trail. What we're here for. I'm trying to open up a book in the um. So I've got here an iBook on the Mac. This is an. It's not like a PDF because you know you can store PDFs in the iBooks app, and they'll sync. Um, I yes. have got a standard. E. It's like an EPUB file here, and I'm just gonna see what happens when I click the side of the screen. My internet connection is so low. I'll put that. I'll come back to that later and I'll do some follow-up um yeah so pro pro stuff so I mean you all were already super power iPad users does this trackpad thing make you feel one step closer to ditching the Mac altogether oh boy I'm still in dire need in FileMaker at school um trying to do this um audio mixing work stuff on my iPad versus Logic I mean, that's almost there, but you got to have a better iPad than mine if you're going to dump that much stuff into it. Um, it's the first time I've ever maxed that iPad out, though, doing audio recording stuff. So a majority of people could probably do it on their iPad. But until I get FileMaker, I can't ditch my Mac. And you know what the other thing is, too? I really like my big external monitor. It's really nice to work on that. I mean, a 12-inch iPad's one thing, but when I go at my desk, even, like, to type documents and everything else, I like that big extra monitor. Yeah. I um I had David McDonald. He's a composer and a composition professor. He was on my last episode. He said his dream is for a giant 17- to 20-inch display that is an external monitor for an iPad that you can draw on. Or you flip a switch and it is uh, it dual boots into Mac OS. How would you feel about that? Would that be your, your sweet spot? Because the screen size certainly is an appeal. I mean, I'm sitting here looking right now. I'm using a Mac Mini at home, but I've got this nice big 25-inch display. Something 25-inch doesn't seem right, but yeah, it's a pretty big display. I wouldn't want to give that up. Well, and I've got I found a 32-inch one on like the best buy f- black friday sales for like 150 bucks and doing music notation stuff on that versus even my 15 inch macbook uh yeah it's a whole lot nicer big huge display but the thing is having the ipad to be able to go mobile is essential for me because i can't take that 32 inch monitor with me but i can grab my ipad and head out to wherever i want that makes sense. Do you, what do you do with FileMaker? That because you know there is an iOS version of FileMaker, but it, it doesn't do all the same stuff. Well, again, we're back to screen size. So you're right. I could put FileMaker on my iPad and just use that, but it's so hard to get the two synchronized together. And I like being have my computer run the FileMaker stuff at school because I use it at school for class lists. I use it for my locker database, for my uniform, for all my instrument inventory. Yeah, you have to pay or find some sort of way to maintain your own FileMaker server if you want to sync between the Mac and the iOS version. You could put a FileMaker database in a Dropbox folder and open it on two different Macs and have no problem. But if you want to work with FileMaker Go, you have to have it on an actual FileMaker server, whether it's hosted by FileMaker or a third party. Oh, yeah. So we've got one at my school, but we're actually paying for server space because we use it to track all that student assessment data I was talking about earlier, but it's a, it's a real drag though. Like, come on, just let, you know what I mean? The only reason it can't do it is because the iOS app doesn't show you the files app. You can't open the fi- a file. Well, you can, but you can't write back to that same location. You have to save it as a duplicate. Which it seems like FileMaker could figure out they are an Apple company. <laughs> I think they want your money for a server is what they want. Once you guys get into the whole file file mark file makers thing, I just kind of back off for a while because I don't do anything with it. So, <laughs> well, and I don't think I will either after I retire. I don't know as if I'll ever open FileMaker again, but right now it's 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 essential. It's just like for people who want their Excel spreadsheets to talk to each other, it's, or or more than that. I mean, you could literally build apps with it, but which is kind of what we what I've done. Well, and I say I, I mean, like my team is using it, but it's all the orchestra director at our school who's wrote all the scripts and all the code. So he's the guy, Ben Denny. Shout out. Tell him he just needs to make an app. There are people who have encouraged him to do that. I mean, the thing is, is like he doesn't want to. 
He wants to teach orchestra, and this gets him to a place where he feels like he can do that his best. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you possess the amount of skill it takes to write what he wrote, yeah, you could totally quit teaching orchestra and make like four or five times as much money <laughs> running FileMaker servers. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, unless you all want to add anything, should we, uh, should we talk a little bit about StaffPad? I have nothing further to add. Right on. So uh, we've been beta testing StaffPad for iPad OS for the past, I guess it's been almost two months. And I thought we could share our thoughts on how it serves our needs as public school educators. When I saw that StaffPad was available for iOS and I watched all the demo videos, um, there was just some of the things that it's some of the capabilities that's built into it that no other app has right now. And some of the ways that it went about doing things that grabbed my attention. The, the hard part is having to handwrite everything. That's a little bit of a hindrance for me because that's the only method of input. And if the handwriting doesn't work, you are out of luck. All you can do is erase and retry it again. And do you find that that's um, a downside only because sometimes the handwriting does not work as you would expect it to, or because there are just enough times that it would be more convenient to do it with MIDI, a MIDI device or the computer keyboard, that it would be worth it to have multiple input methods? I don't feel like handwriting is always the fastest way. If I'm standing in front of my class and I want to draw some music notation things and even like, you know, composition, small composition things in front of my class, handwriting is amazing because it's so natural and I don't have to think about which tools to grab. Um, when I'm sitting at home and I'm writing out a part for somebody um, and I, if I have to start from scratch, I'm not so sure handwriting is the quickest way to go. Um, if I have to edit a part, and, you know, because I use one of the scanning apps, music scanning apps, I kind of like being able to edit it with just the handwriting. Yeah, I, I can certainly get behind that. So for, and let me just, maybe I should give a little bit of background for, if there's anyone who does not know and is listening, StaffPad is a notation editor for iPad OS that has previously for the past five years been on Windows Surface only. And yeah, as you said, uh, the primary method at which it gets notes and dynamics and other markings into it is by writing with the Apple Pencil. I do think that of all the apps that accept note input with the Apple Pencil, this is by far my favorite and the most consistent implementation of that. Now, I know you all both use Notion a lot, which has the same feature, so maybe you all can speak to that better than I can. Well, I know I was just, knowing that we were gonna to talk today, I went back to StaffPad. Um, Ultimately, StaffPad, and I've had a chance to talk with, you know, StaffPad a little bit about this too. Just like um, Dorico, just until recently, for the stuff that I'm doing these days with ukulele and stuff, I have a pretty narrow focus of, of what I need a, a program to do. And up until not too long ago, Dorico couldn't do it. And StaffPad still doesn't do it. So... A lot of what StaffPad offers right now is of really, and I hate to say this this way, but it really, it's of, of no use to me until they add additional features for guitar and ukulele and things like that. Um, but I, I pulled out StaffPad, you know, I'd used it before to see how it would work. And I know there's, we've had a couple, because we're in the beta, just so people know, um, all three of us, we asked if, if they'd be willing to either give us perusal copies or something. And the, the logical solution was to make us all beta testers. So we're on the most recent beta, I think, all of us, that I don't remember when that one pushed out. But I, I haven't used this new beta yet because I just haven't needed to. But um, the same things that I've been struggling with, with the handwriting of it, not recognizing things. And then the, the nightmare of, I, I don't like the erasing mode where you push harder to go into eraser mode because you don't get a real good indicator that you go into a racing mode. There's no like indicator that tells you that you're in a racing mode. Um, but that whole process and then tapping out of the measure to recognize the measure 
ends up putting a dot in the next measure then that eventually you have to do something with when you touch the next measure. I was finding that um, they would go away. Did it, Is that what you're finding? Okay. Uh, yeah. But it's just like, uh, all that stuff. And then I went over to Notion today and I wrote the same things that I tried to write in staff pad that frustrated me. And they all worked with the handwriting in Notion. I mean, my 16th notes that I, I struggle with having like eighth notes and 16th notes be recognized. Um, I write my rests a little bit like a, a sharper bird rather than loopy, you know, like a three. I write my quarter rests that way. Um, staff pad can't recognize those. Notion picks it up right away. And I don't, I don't use handwriting a ton in Notion, but um, it still does, it, it did, I'll just say this, it was, it was a hundred percent improvement over staff pad for me. And just in comparison of, of accuracy. And then the other thing that I would add is I do most of my work right now in writing music on my iPad in notion. Um, and one of the cool things that notion has is it has a, a fretboard for a guitar or ukulele that you can, you can pull up and you can enter notes that way too, by touching that where, you know, on the fret and string that you want a note to go if you're writing individual notes. And that that actually is a pretty quick workflow for me too. So it's not just the keyboard. I actually work pretty quickly in Notion. Maybe I work faster in Finale, but but it's pretty close. Yeah, I think Chris, I found the same experiences with some of the, the handwriting things. Notion recognizes more, and I don't know if that's my fault, um, for being really super sloppy. Um, the more I've played with staff pad, the better I've gotten it to nice, or maybe the, the more it's trained to me in the way that it wants me to draw things. Um, and the last beta that just popped out did fix some of those hand drawing things, handwriting things, but it's still easier notion to get it to recognize everything that I want it to, write. which is surprising because staff pad has done the handwriting for a long time, but it's been on Windows. And I don't know if the experience in Windows is any better. I know if you watch the, the demo things, the people who did the demos, I don't know if it was David or who, but they make it look absolutely astoundingly easy to do the handwriting stuff. So since we're talking about handwriting a lot, I thought I would chime in with, like I, I've tried the handwriting in a lot of these different apps that can do it, which, and, and actually a lot of them other than Staff Pad use the same engine. Like I know there's that one Comp, there's Symphony Pro, and I don't, I'm, my understanding is that a couple of them share the same handwriting engine for music notation, but I haven't spent enough time with any of them to where I've, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit if as Notion users, you'll have just kind of learned the Notion way. Cause like as a non Notion, as a, someone who's hasn't used any of them, I can't say, cause, okay. Cause like ultimately we want to get to where it feels just as easy to do this. Like you're writing on paper, right? Like, so, and, and like, none of them do, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> there isn't a single one of these apps where you don't feel like you're fussing with a computer program at a certain point. Correct. Um, it, so I guess I could say that I have now that I've really, really gave it a try and have, we've been sticking with a couple different beta revisions. I guess I can say that staff pad is the one that I know the best. Like I really fought with it for a couple of weeks, but then as I played with it and I think actually the, the betas have even in these like minor point releases that have been coming out in the past two months. I actually think the engine has been getting better it, equal to the fact that I've also been learning it a little bit better. Um, there are still some things that I cannot get to Like I can't write a forte at all, but there are things where the handwriting, it's not so much the success of the recognition as it is the design of how it wants to be used, which make it still a lot more user-friendly for me. And I guess like the idea of like, Chris, you were saying you have to like poke outside of a measure in order to get it to, or start writing a new measure to get it to register the previous one. I actually love that because when I'm in Notion, I'm writing and as I'm finishing my thought, Notion starts guessing what it wants. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. That was going to be a, a 16th note. Whereas, uh, right, and Staff Pad will, not only that, but it'll let you leave put too many beats in a measure it'll let you put too few beats in a measure it'll even guess what it can and if you draw a rest that you can recognize but it can't it'll leave convert part of it and leave your scribble in there 
So, I mean, it's designed in a, in a way that's really flexible for me. Um, oh, and I even, I even, it's funny. I love the eraser tool. If not, which by the way, I think you can turn off the hard press to erase now and just have a toggle. Um, but I love it. Like it's definitely trips me up from time to time where I accidentally erase, but I also love the idea that I'm not fiddling with a toolbar for changing my annotation tool. So I guess part of it is just differences in experience and in pref, you know, in, in preference for design, but, or maybe I've just spent more time in staff pad now, but it, it certainly got easier, but I agree with you both that like more ways to input notes is better. Like Chris, you were saying with the, having the guitar interface and the handwriting, like for me, when I used to use Sibelius, I would have my computer keyboard, my mouse and my piano keyboard all like within reach because wherever, whatever my brain wants to use in that moment is going to be the fastest. Well, I haven't used the side with notion too much with connect connecting a MIDI keyboard to my iPad. Paul, I don't know if you've done that with notion to enter notes. I've done it just a little bit. I really haven't slaved the iPad very often to my CME, um, what do you call it thing, the X key error that I've got. Incidentally, by the way, they made an announcement that that new master thing is for sale. Now, they're off, are offering a pre-sale on those. I just thought talking about current news, there's this whole new technology that it is becomes a, a MIDI cable for your different devices. That's available now, but... Um, but yeah, I haven't I haven't slaved Notion to a keyboard very often, but I know that you can. Um, so you could even have that option, Notion, and I don't even think that works with StaffPad, right? You can't plug a keyboard no. into it at all. No. There's no real-time recording of any kind or anything like that either. No. And again, I think that's part of where this app came from is some of these um, composers that wanted a way to handwrite music out really quick in the moment and then also the other side of it is to be able to have an amazing playback library. The sample libraries, especially the, well, even the built-in sounds that you get when you buy staff pad, they're, they sound wonderful. And Notion as well sounds amazing. But then when you start adding on the external libraries that uh, like Spitfire in Berlin, um, those string libraries and brass libraries, no shame to those. There's still some issues that they're working out. They just pushed out some updates for those libraries as well. Because I know like when I was drawing in staccatos, some of the staccatos would actually end up being louder than the notes around them. Um, so that was interesting. And they're starting to fit stuff too. So Yeah, I guess as if you had a... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Robbie. <laughs> no, I was going to kind of take it a different direction that you seemed like you were responding no, no, it's okay. I was going to respond to the, the libraries of sounds. Yeah, do that, because that's definitely an appeal. The way that, I mean, there's a downside to, it's like, if you want to buy Spitfire audio plugins on the Mac, well, then they work with all of your digital audio workstations. They are like software instruments in of themselves. Whereas in StaffPad, they, you know, it's only going to, the purchase is only going to work inside of StaffPad, but man, they do work very, very seamlessly well. Yeah, we, we had a conversation with uh, David about that just over email, and he just indicated that there was no way for them to make those sound libraries open to other apps. And that was, that's just, that's so hard. I mean, maybe that's reality, but it's just so hard to swallow. That's a big price tag. I can't remember how much they were. Paul, you would probably know right off the bat. Yeah, they're like $90 or more. They are. They're very expensive. Whereas... You know, I mean, just that that's a lot. You're already paying a lot for the app. I mean, now granted, maybe that's the price that these apps should be. But then you've got the add-on of the additional sounds, potentially if you want the best sounds. And then those sounds are just locked to staff pad. That's, that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, but the one thing that I do would love, love to play with more is to import some scores into staff pad and then play with the shaping of, of contours, of dynamics, and other things that you can do. I think you can do that with tempo. I think you can do that with um, just like dynamics. And you can actually visually shape what you want to hear. And that that's exciting. I think Dorico does some of that too at some point, doesn't it? Yeah, but doing it with, with the accuracy of the Apple Pencil is so magical. To be able to just take an automation layer like volume 
or like tempo and just draw it right on the screen. And it's, it's really, I've, I've done enough of it in, like I haven't had a need to really do it in staff pad, but I've of course wanted to play with it. And the feeling of drawing the automation is so much smoother and more precise than any other, like I'm trying to think of other DAWs on the iPad that lets you even use the Apple Pencil. Like I know I use Fairlight to edit this show and you can draw points, but I don't think you can actually draw the shape of the line. I think you have to just tap where you want the different points to be and then drag them up and down. Like if you're doing a volume automation, but with staff pad, if you want a crescendo, you just draw it exactly the shape that you want that crescendo. And it's just like butter. Yep. That was one of the things that amazed me when I saw this app was the automation tools because like doing tempos, Tempo changes for years has just driven me nuts. You know, when I've been trying to do MIDI keyboard stuff and sequencing, ever since I started doing it back in the 80s, it's always been a hassle to try to do a really nice, smooth uh, retarder and accelerando and stuff. And like you said, Robbie, grab that Apple Pencil and just to draw in that automation in, inside a staff pad for tempos, for dynamics. It, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And then it, there's this other element of annotation where you go into, there's a, there's a mode where you can actually just freehanded draw and highlight right over your score without altering the notes at all. And the idea that this is yet another way that the Apple Pencil is this tool for you that can be super accurate, but provide another utility. It's kind of, it's kind of magical. So, so I guess my perspective is, I mean, like one of the themes, Chris, you were hitting at is that all of these digital audio workstations and notation apps, especially the newer ones that have come to market, are really more limited in features. And they're going to appeal, I think, to a really general or broad audience. And then the people who need either the power or who need like one really small specific avenue of features are going to probably be waiting for a little while. Um, Before they move on staff pad, you mean? Well, I'm just saying like someone who needs to have like really specific tabs or chord symbols for specific stringed instruments. Like that's probably not the thing that the most people in the user community want. So it's probably not like at the top of their list. Right. Um, For me, I found that staff pad was actually a really, really good balance of what it could and could not do just because my needs are so general right now. Like I'm doing things like reconstructing missing flute parts from the band library or saying like, okay, there's four percussion parts, but I've got 10. Let me arrange six real quick. And I'm just finding like every screen right from the very launch of the application where you see that your most recently used documents, like every screen, every user interface element is to me just the, the right amount of things that it gives you to do on the screen versus things that it does not allow you to do. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot where I was thinking like, ooh, I wish I could move like this forte symbol over just a little bit more. Like I, I could do that in Dorico with the engraving tools or ooh, if only I could like have a marching, uh, a mariachi band template or, or something like this. Like to me, it, it was just a real sweet spot of what it could do. I, I love the feel of inputting notes by pencil. I love where the menus are. I love where you long tap certain places to get like changing the bar lines and where you long tap in other places to get things like changing text like it's to me it's just a very very smooth touch first experience but you're both right that it is very much a touch well it's a touch only (laughs) experience i guess is maybe it's where the hang up is at some points well in the it's very elegant like the way he allows us to do um crescendos from a day crescendo to a crescendo and you just drag up or down uh, drawn in tremolos and such, it's so easier than trying to do it in some of these other apps. Um, and it is, it's a, it's a well, it, it looks very appealing to the eye. So, you know, the, the aesthetics of the way that it's put together has been well thought out. Paul, have you been able to do anything with like your, you know, you were working on a music, are you guys going to be able to do the musical anymore that you were working on? No, it's canceled. <laughs> You know, at some point, I would assume that maybe we're going to do that musical, um, you know, in in a future year. So hopefully all the work that I've already put into it isn't lost. But, um, you know, so like 
I assume that you were asking if I could put staff pad to use in that musical. Yeah, in terms of even like the sound production or, or a rehearsal track or something for for students to use in some way. Well, again, we're back to the, those sound libraries are just outstanding. Um, so the sound to create a rehearsal track, that's one of the reasons that staff pad exists because it can create a recording where it's very realistic um and notion does a pretty decent job especially with the strings in notion but the brass and the percussion and the woodwinds and such yeah it's it's a game the other thing with staff pad is uh the the free reader app have either of you tried that i just have no purpose for it in my life but it looks amazing well that's the problem, right? It's like this amazing possibility of what the future is going to be, maybe. But if five iPads, one iPad could be that master syncing out the music to all the other iPads, and it will play your score from your master device, and all the other iPads can pull up, you know, the the start to clear now, and it'll all stay in sync. And everybody has a headphone click track. They plug in, you know, they plug headphones into their iPad. They've got a click track that they can play along with. Well, and the composer. Which solves. Yeah. It, yeah, it solves that whole issue of, because I've thought about that. I've, I've tried to find solutions to this in the band room where I have a metronome up front. And then the people in the back can have that same metronome going without me having speakers in the front of the room over top of the marching band volume. And Staff Pad solves that that problem with this reader app. Yeah, it's it's one of those areas where the like I can see the benefit of that in multiple different scenarios, just not where actually you could depend on all the musicians in the ensemble having an iPad to use that. I mean, it's becoming more and more common. Um, but it seems to be like staff pad seems to be wearing its vision on its sleeve a little bit with this reader app. It seems kind of like for me for session and studio musicians, the idea that the composer can just erase a note, scribble in a new rhythm in the flute part. And then all of a sudden it's just magically beamed to the flute player's iPad. And then, you know, the adjustments are all happening on the fly in real time. I would love to be able to use something like that with my band, but that's just not a reality for as many scenarios I mean, I would love to know if anyone out there is using something like the staff pad reader who is not it, a session or a studio musician. That seems to be the primary use case. But yeah, it's, I mean, it sincerely is magical and amazing. Um, you had wrote a post. You've done a few posts with Notion and your school musical over the years. I'm going to link those in the show notes. But sure. So staff pad, one of the things you do is you have some of the instrument parts to your musical you're, you're doing some arranging in Notion, but then Notion is also actually like the output for some of the instruments through the actual speakers during the musical. Is that right? That is correct. We have absolutely zero string players in our like little small community. And we also have zero budget to hire string players. Um, so yeah, I'm using Notion as my string players. And the other thing with Notion is that it has the end tempo, the, the conductor's track feature. So I can use a mini keyboard and I can tap tempo along with the live singers on stage and the live people in the pit. And if we're slowing down or speeding up or whatever, Notion will follow us. And it's, it's, it is flawless. So since the primary end goal for that is to get high quality audio, you're thinking that staff pad actually might be a good tool for this job since the quality of the audio samples is so high it would be except for i'm really leery about the fact that staff pad does not allow me to tap tempo and you know the reality of the situation of of you know a pit orchestra where most of it is live and then middle school and high school singers on stage they're not going to always be able to follow that track flawlessly and that worries me. If Staff Pad would let me do that, it'd be awesome because I think the sound quality would be better. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. So other than the tap tempo, the workflow of Staff Pad would be adequate in addition to the sound quality? 
Well, we're back to the whole thing of I tried to use staff pad and since the only input option available is handwriting. I had issues. Okay. So that was really in your way. It was. And now it's gotten better with these later beta releases. Um, but it was just so frustrating trying to draw an accent in it. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Would not do it. Um, you know, some of those things like that. Now, the beta things has have fixed the accents. I can draw accents, but it's just it, when you run into a wall and it, what you want to show up on that page doesn't show up. You, I mean, you're done. You can't rely on a menu to input something. You can't rely on you drag and drop a, a quarter note in there or whatever. So yeah, you're out of luck. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting that their development cycle is showing so much progress with the core note input method which is the handwriting um because that that shows that they're definitely making fast progress in that way i would suspect that down the road right. there will be some other input methods there's a lot of people asking for it on their user forums right yeah they've been working hard right um interesting so yeah i'll, pu- I'll put your notion musical blog post in the notes to the show i'll also all of us wrote one or more things about staff pad on our blogs i'll add those to the show notes too I say, Paul, did you mention that uh, when you're talking Notion, you're talking about running it from your Mac and not the iPad during the music? Oh, that is a good point to make. Yeah, because the you know Notion on iPad and Notion on the computer have a lot of the same features, but some of those things like the tap tempo is not available on iPad. You have to do it with the Mac, and you have to spend time with it. Because like you, Robbie, the more time I spent with it, the better the I got it writing the way it wanted me to write. But now we're back to price too. You know, over general public people, the general public overwhelmingly is going to about have a heart attack when they hear $90 for the basic app. So again, we're back to what is the target audience for this app? And I don't think it's just the general public. Right. Well, the general public is always going to hesitate in this way, like I would say in the music world, Sibelius or Finale are our best examples of like, if you're a music teacher and you buy one professional app, it's going to be one of those two. And the only reason why you're going to do it is because everybody, you know, has one of those two options and swears by it. And it's that one major giant purchase that you make. I mean, some people still use Sibelius, I don't think six works anymore on most modern machines, but like Sibelius six or seven, like most people are still on it because you make that one big purchase. I mean, that's, and that's just within our field. Most people never make an application purchase like that. It's funny Sibelius six because I finally had to wave goodbye. That was the last version I bought and I finally upgraded to Catalina. So six work. Did you opt to buy a... What's the word they use for not when you subscribe to the app, but when you get like, for, we'll give you all the updates for like a year or two years. What's that called? A temporary license or a, it's not a subscription because you can subscribe to Sibelius or you can buy it outright, the perpetual? but they tell you perpetual license. That's it. Yeah. They, so they, they tell you how long you'll get the updates for, which I actually think is a pretty fair way of keeping a buy it once model around while also being transparent and clear with people how long they're going to get updates. I also don't like Sibelius, so I'm not going to buy it, but (laughs) that's just me. I agree to each their own, right? (laughs) Were you, you a, you were a finale user before Robbie? No, I was Sibelius. I think Sibelius got a lot of things right. That just didn't jive for me with finale, but um, I just, you know, I, I don't think that they showed a lot of hustle with their design. I think it got really dated and really crusty. Uh, the program would take a really long time to load. So when Dorico came out a couple of years ago with something a lot cleaner and more powerful that was reimagining note input with the key- computer keyboard, which is for me a method of entry that I really prefer, um, I switched to that and I didn't really look back. I'll Every now and then I'll have a Sibelius score that I'll, I'll go to Avid's website and I'll download the little utility just cause I, cause I have, I have Sibelius installed on my desktop at home where I can boot it up every now and then to get, but I, but I have that, that thing that Avid installs on your computer that has to run in the background. 
if you want to run Pro Tools or Sibelius, I can't stand that that thing. I keep that off unless I need to boot up Pro Tools or Sibelius, which is rare. All right, what else do we have to say about this, guys? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a I certainly could nitpick all the little design choices that I really love, but it's it's in my review. I just think it's it's really elegant. Um, I personally, I am gonna probably continue to use it. Um, it will not fulfill all of my score needs. And that's exactly the thing is it's like, if you're the kind of educator who wants one score app, I hesitate to tell you about something that's iOS only and has Apple Pencil support only. But at the same time, I think it does a good job nailing the needs of most people. So while I would on the one hand recommend it, I will also still use Dorico on the Mac. Um, And I'm not the kind of person who makes one giant music notation purchase i'm okay having multiple tools with multiple strengths well and that's like anybody who's building a house they don't have just a hammer and a screwdriver there's lots of different tools and i think this is one of those tools that does what it does in an amazing way and there's things that staff pad does that no other app does like this like the automation in this in the in the staff pad reader stuff um and some of the design elements, it's, it is it is very nice. I'm going to keep using it. I know that. I can't rely on just one app, so I'm going to have several. See, I, I agree that I think the strength comes in what you do after you get the notes into StaffPad. I think that's its real strength. That's its real power right now. The problem is the price that it costs to get into it, um, not just the app, but, but the other sounds you have to buy. Um, but when it comes down to the average person, if they had an iPad and they told me they were, for example, a music educator, and they said, should I get Notion with all of its add-ons, which I think it's like, what, $40 for all their sounds, $7 for handwriting, whatever, and then like, I don't know how much the app is now, it's under $20. Do you buy Notion and all that, or do you get spend the $90 on StaffPad Plus? I would have to recommend at this point, most people look at Notion first, but I certainly understand why people would want to check out StaffPad, and I'm not done with it either, but I'm just waiting for it to add other functionality, really. And again, maybe I just represent a small percentage of use, but I I would think that many elementary teachers would be looking at ways to quickly write one line of music with text, and for that, staff pad is probably overkill and not perfectly suited. Right. Yeah. Those are good closing thoughts, I think. <laughs> Unless y'all got more. Well, I like the way that Chris just said that too. You know, a lot of the power of what staff pad can do comes in um, from what you can do with the notes afterwards. And, um, like, is it easier? Is it easier to do stuff once the notes are in, or is it more powerful? to do stuff once the notes are in or both. I think both because I think the power is there. Um, you know, the automation, it's not there in a lot of the other apps. Um, the sound libraries, that's, that's a power, it's a power user thing where, Hey, I, I want the best realistic sound demo that I can put out from somebody else. And oh yeah, by the way, all I have is an iPad. So, you know, that power is almost unmatched in some ways, um, but being able to do the articulations and the accents and the crescendos and all that other stuff with just the pencil or the Apple pencil on my iPad, yeah, that's easy. Did anybody generate a PDF out of StaffPad to see how it looked and compared it to what you'd get out of other products? Yeah, and I really loved it, actually. That was another thing that was one of my favorite features was how simple and fuss-free the layout screen was when you are exporting to XML or PDF. Again, the thing is, it's like you don't have the same custom tools. Like something like Dorico will have way more buttons and knobs that you can switch. Whereas I felt really, really at ease with StaffPad because it gave me less options, but the options were exactly the options that I wanted to see. And it made some choices for me about how things were laid out where I could not control how certain slurs or the spacing between certain bar lines looked. But the way that it generated a document for me 
looked really, really, really close to what I would have wanted with very minimal tweaks. So it struck a real good balance for me. But again, if you're an edge case or if you're looking to tweak some of those things, maybe that's not going to work in your favor. And most educators are okay with some of those decisions being made with us as long as it looks pretty decent when they get it printed out. Because we are going to have to print things as educators. See, one of the things I'm thinking about here is, again, looking at, we, we all have to look at things through the eyes of what we use it for, right? You know, so that's kind of how we're stuck. And right now I'm not dealing with choral scores. And if I am, it's only two parts in piano. And I'm not dealing with a band score with looking at how many of our lines you guys are looking at, which both, both Robbie, you and Paul both look at, you know, those master scores all day long. But I'm thinking like, even in terms of like, let's say I was uh, in charge of a local ukulele club and right now for example um, a lot of the ukulele players are going to using a large tablet generally an ipad to read their music because you don't want to carry a binder of music around anymore and then you have instant access well if you had a, a program like staff pad where you could share the song you had entered the song with the chords in it which doesn't exist yet in the way that that we would need it and you could beam that instantly to every member of the group and, you know, talking, you know, 30 people max, um, that would have real, real valuable use in the real world right now as a tool that could be used. And I'm not saying that that's why Staff Pad should go make ukulele stuff, but I'm just saying I, I can see where um, in some real world adult things where adults had iPads because you can't guarantee that kids are going to have them. Um, man, it could be really powerful. Or if they had their Windows Surface, because that's the other benefit, is that if you know somebody with that Surface tablet, they can get beamed your document too. It's not just iPad, so it's not just the iPad users. So there's there's some power in that, but we're just, I don't know, in education, we're one step removed with that issue of device that we actually talked about way at the beginning of this recording, you know? And the fact that that staff pad reader is free. Yep. So you're back to the ukulele group. You've got one person that actually had to buy something. Yes. And then 29 other people that downloaded a free app. Except worship teams would be the same sort of thing. Our worship team is all on iPads. You know, so we've got 10 people on stage, and one person could pop that out to everybody. So, Do worship teams read music anymore, Paul? Well, let me tell you what. Doing this <laughs> audio mixing thing, you know, we, we, we put out a click track with a basic piano or a guitar track on it and not being able to listen to each other. No, no. We just made that everything lined up and we all kind of found the same groove and imagined the same groove this week. And uh, it, it worked out all right. But, you know, chord tracks, they read the chords and um, our, the keyboard players do read the music. And uh, if we had somebody that was actually writing out the vocal harmonies, people pay a lot of money, uh, like Planning Center and Song Select, to buy those things. Yeah, when I was running a band at a church, we um, we used Planning Center, and it would be kind of hard to. It took it took it was one of those things where like you wanted to do all the work beforehand because you didn't want to have to do anything other than tap the right side of the page to sequence through the service in the actual moment of it going on. So switching between something like a staff pad reader and a planning center would be that's like, I try to leave as little room for error as possible. Right. That would be a bit much <laughs> for me. Well, you know, and actually that's, that's where I'm at. And I think, I don't know if I remember, I, I don't remember if I wrote this or not, but I said, what I would really love is to see something like a, a mixture of what staff pad offers right now and what notion offers right now. I'd, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see the functionality of both interact with each other, but that's not how software where works, unfortunately. You know, companies don't do that, but man, would I love that. I'd love to see the strengths of Notion with the strengths of StaffPad, just like the idea of the strength of OnSong or the strength of Planning Center merged with StaffPad in that mindset would be pretty cool. Well, you're you're making me think of the... Um... In the same way that, you know, and, and I know that this is probably still a feature, but on the Mac, you had the people who developed Reason made that rewire feature, which eventually became a standard where you could link two different audio workstation apps together and do some work in one and some work in another and have the playback be in sync. 
So you could have your Sibelius score sounding simultaneously, you know, at the same time as your logic project that you're working on. And I, th- I thought that was cool. I mean, the same thing is somewhat happening on iOS with, you make me think of the um, the issue we were talking about earlier with these really expensive sounds, how the Spitfire sounds, for example, on a PC, you can run those sound libraries in any digital audio workstation, whereas they're just locked into StaffPad on the iPad version. Well, iOS has a, pl- like has a plugin system <laughs> for audio apps to talk to each other, but it doesn't really seem to have taken off with any of the major companies that like, like, for example, I see tons of small developers making reverbs that you can plug into the iOS GarageBand app, but I haven't seen Waves or Isotope make a plugin that you can plug into GarageBand. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like the inner app audio apps. Oh yeah. There's, there's quite a few of them out there, but you just have to look in the right spot for, for them. Um, There's a lot of like, the audio unit threes. Yeah, you use a lot of the Korg stuff, right? A lot of the synthesizers. Those all work with in-app, inter-app audio apps. Right, right, exactly. And they'll work with with uh, Cubasis or GarageBand. iOS and and iOS will speak um, back and forth to a desktop app, app too. So if StaffPad got something like Rewire built into it, you know, I could run the end tap feature from Notion on my mac but have some of the sounds being driven from staff pad what's an example of two applications on ios and the mac that'll work together i have never done that before um like my logic or um for some of the worship stuff that i just did i had my synths coming off my ipad but they were getting recorded into logic on my desktop so um and like uh, Logic has the um, the remote. That's pretty ni- nice. So I can have my iPad sitting over my over by my k- keyboard, and it will remote control my Mac, which is across the room on my desk. How did you have the when you had the audio unit on your iPad recording directly into Logic for the Mac? How did you have that set up? Do you remember the name of the plugin you were using? Well, it helps that I have the right interface as well. <laughs> So that's part of the issue, issue too is, you know, I've, I have an iConnect Audio 4 interface, which lets my iPad, my Mac, and my keyboards all talk to each other. Gotcha. So that's not a software technology. You've you've wired that all together. Right. Yep. Yeah, interesting. Well, and I'm hoping, I say it all the time, I'm hoping that now that we got this nice new cursor support, that this is an indication that Final Cut and Logic are not far behind because you can't have an iPad Pro and not have any Pro software on it um i would love to see can i dreamcast i'm gonna i'm gonna dreamcast (laughs) um you know pro tools has a cloud collaboration feature where even if you use audio plugins that another user who's collaborating with you does not have installed on an audio track it'll process that audio edit and bounce it down before committing it to the cloud version i would love to see if there could ever be, and if it's not, if it was some third party who figured it out, then great. But I would love for Logic to be able to do, you know, all the same basic audio editing tools and features that you have on the Mac, on the iPad. But additionally, let's say you've got an Isotope plugin, adding a reverb to a track on the Mac, and then you hit the save button that goes to iCloud. I would love in, during that save to iCloud process, if the Mac could say, hey, you know what, let me just process that reverb on this audio track it's applied to once so that when you play this back on a different iOS device, you can at least hear the edits you made, even if you can't actually open the plugin and edit them. So I don't know, probably that requires a whole lot of processing power and internet stuff that we maybe aren't there yet, but we gotta be close. Right. Hey, I had a thought as we're probably drawing to some kind of close here, but um, you know how iOS and iCloud now offers file or actual file sharing, like folder sharing. Should we try putting our audio recordings into a shared folder? It's getting closer. It's getting better. <laughs> yep. Okay. That, I'm glad you brought. I'm glad you brought that up because yep. that's very topical, <laughs> as well as practical for this show. 
to be edited and happen. Um, I am going to ask that, yes, as an experiment, I think we should try that. I'm going to also ask that you, that if I, like, if I share an iCloud folder, can I also share a Dropbox folder too for you to dump the audio into? Yeah, because I've been, iCloud folder sharing has only been out for like a week or so. Um, I don't know if I'm just having bad luck, but I have tried to share, I tried to upload my first iCloud folder to share with some members of my music team. And I sat and stared at a spinning wheel for 30 minutes before giving up on it. Now, (laughs) now it was the entire library of sheet music that our music department has. It was a very important folder, but it was a very, like I was definitely throwing a lot of work at it. So yeah, for something simple, three audio files, I think we should totally try it. And then I can follow up in a future episode on how well it works. But yeah, if we could also use Dropbox as a backup. Not a problem. Cool. And I, I, the other thing I just want to say is I just, I feel bad when I, I have like negative things to say about an app. I feel bad when I say that staff pad doesn't work for me. Um, and I, this isn't like to curry favor with staff pad or anything, but it is a beautiful app. I appreciate it that it's out on iPad. Um, but it's just, it's just not, it's not something that I can use yet, and I don't want to be mean about that either. So I, I don't know. I just always feel uncomfortable. I learned long ago with Aaron Nelson, who you know did Unreal Book early on in my blogging. I was very critical of his app, and he sent me a message back basically saying, "Well, that really hurt. You know, I'm just a single guy here in Hawaii, just making an app, and uh, but I'll try to do better." I even picked on his icon at one point. That is, turns out that his daughter had drawn. <laughs> Um, which was, I didn't even know that, but I just like, yeah, the icon looks unprofessional. He's like, well, yeah, my daughter drew that. And so I just, I learned so much there. So I, I don't know. I don't want anybody to think that I hate the program or that I don't like it. I just, for me, I see the strength would come in everything after you get the notes in right now. That's where the strength comes for me. Um, and that's where I'd want to use it until it can do some ukulele stuff. And then when it does, then I'm willing to like try it again. And from the very, very start start you know and and to see if it can actually fill my needs as a music teacher but right now it can't but again i realize that i'm this elementary teacher which is using ukulele and needs to write ukulele resources so that's just that's the last thing i want to say before the program ends here yeah i don't think there's anything unfair about having those needs and offering that perspective where it's due because I think if someone who's listening to this is the kind of person who probably is asking the question, do I spend the 90 or so bucks? Um, and if they're in your position, then all, all of that criticism is absolutely fair. So, so totally. Correct. Well, and, you know, another thing to kind of wrap this up, too, um, for people that are on Facebook, there's a very active staff, uh, staff pad group. And there's also a, a very active uh, Notion users group as well. So feel free to join those spots. Um, that's that's interesting to know. This might make me actually get back on Facebook this week. I thought you were trying to get rid of all those notifications, <laughs> Robbie. <laughs> no, I just <laughs> I just want to I just don't want to be reading how do you do virtual choir anymore. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's all I'm done with. Hey, how would I do, Robbie? How would I do a a virtual ukulele jam? Can you tell me some apps that I could use for that? <laughs> and what do I do about the lag, Robbie? What do I what do, do about, about it? the lag? Gosh, I've seen, I've just seen it so many times. I wanted to, I did a post rec- recently too. It's funny, you mentioned um, Katie Wardrobe's excellent blog post she wrote earlier about, and I think her sassy title is something to the effect of Stop Asking How to Do Virtual Band Choir Orchestra. And And despite that title, you're right, she's a lovely and sweet person. And it also is a very helpful and practical post. Um, But it's funny because I was going through the same thing because I wrote a blog post recently about um, kind of like some of the tools and strategies I'm using to teach private lessons remote. And I I certainly have a little bit, I can see how someone would read the tone of the title of this post as a little bit dry and annoyed at the music community right now. It's it's called My Very Straightforward and Very Successful Setup for Teaching Virtual Private Lessons. Yep, I read it. And then inside... (laughs) Yeah, and then it says step one: use a phone. Step two: use FaceTime if you have it. If not, Google. Like that's, 
And I recently added to it because people posted some like legitimately reasonable questions in response to where I shared that on social media. Like, okay, but like, what if I do want to level up and use a nicer microphone or where, you know, so I, so I added some stuff to it, but it's funny. It's, um, you want to be helpful, but sometimes it's like the, the thing that you want to say is when someone asks like, how do I get rid of the lag? I just want to like post a billboard that says you don't, you can't band, you can't do band rehearsal (laughs) online. Um, and that's just unfortunately where we are. And I think that that question is not coming from a place. Sometimes I think it's coming from a place of undue anxiety and where people are trying to overcomplicate or over-engineer a problem. But I think it's also coming very much from a place of just wanting, like missing the reason why we love doing music, which is to meet in person with kids and play instruments or sing at the same time. So I try to keep that in mind, but I absolutely stand by my, if anyone perceived the dryness in the tone of my blog post title, I stand by it. <laughs> well, and I think it's a fair question. We have a whole world of educators that are not as tech oriented as what we are, that have not used as much tech and apps as what we do. So it's a fair question. You know, can we do a, a virtual band rehearsal? But like I was talking with one of the other people that, as we're doing our little worship team thing, how do you find the answer to these questions? Go to Google and just type in a soya guys, because it's not that hard to find out the answer to some of these stuff. Well, and it's like, and I, and I'm there too. And that's an equal frustration, but then it's like you, you go to Facebook and it's like, well, okay, you should probably search or scroll a little bit, but at the same time, like Facebook is not really a good place for this kind of information to be shared because there's no, sidebar there's no easy way to pin information like it would be great is if if in a facebook group you could have a a constantly visible sidebar where it said like um in all bold and all caps which voice chat app do i use and then there was a link to that google doc that explains them all in detail um how do i do virtual band and then there was a link to katie's article (laughs) um (laughs) like where which microphones should i buy and you know what i mean like it would be great but that's not what facebook is so no but anyway, I'm excited about a staff pad group. Anytime there's a legitimately nerdy group happening on Facebook, like the Mac Power Users podcast used to have a Facebook group. And I, it was like my one reason to be on Facebook every day. <laughs> and I think that that community is con- really conscious of Facebook's privacy issues, which are many. Right. So they decided to go to an online forum based platform which i totally understand and appreciate but i just don't facebook is a place that i have other reasons to be so i just i don't see the mac power user stuff anymore so it's kind of a bummer but i get it so last closing thoughts well i I usually i have um a segment that i've been doing since i rebooted my show this fall i've got album of the week and app of the week pick and it doesn't have to be really lengthy, but if you even just want to share a title. I also, before we do that, I have, um, I did open iBooks on my Mac and you can not you can tap on the right and the left side of the screen, or I should say click, but because it's the Mac and everything is all like very refined and accurate, it you can't click anywhere on the right or the left. You actually hover towards the very end of the page and then a little left and right arrow appear when you hover over that area of the mouse. So just to follow up with earlier, that's how that works on the Mac. And then I wanted to say one piece of follow-up from last episode. Um, David McDonald and I talked about PDF Expert and Pencil Kit support uh, and how I wanted to be able to use the same annotation tools that are in the Apple Notes app, but in PDF Expert. Because you can do it, like if you're in the app MindNode, which is a great mind mapping application for the iPad and the Mac, um, you can actually... you can. Um, do the screenshot shortcut where you hold the power button and the side button for volume up. And then instead of a screenshot, you can actually tap entire this little option to do the entire document. And then the, the Apple custom tools pop up on screen, the same ones that you have in an Apple notes. So you can like use the Apple tools to scribble, even though it's a mind node document. So PDF expert in their most recent update said that it had pencil kit support and I couldn't find anything anywhere other than their standard tools for annotation. So what I have learned, I did some research, and what I have learned is that A, 
Um, Pencil Kit is not just those tools. It's an engine. It's an ink engine. Um, So it is entirely possible that Pencil Kit is just, they're just using the engine. But then what I also found is that if you open a non-PDF in PDF Expert, like a PNG file, then it does show the Apple tools Hmm. on display instead of the PDF Expert annotation tools. So that's like a really, really refined nerd point that probably no one cares about, but I thought I would add (laughs) that I figured out the answer to my question from last time. Um, Anyway, do you have an app, an app or an album of the week? Man, what do you, what do you have as your most recent album? Um, so I've got, um, the most recent thing that I've been listening to is the new Thundercat record. Are you all familiar with Thundercat? I am not. Um, Thundercat is, uh, he is a, how do you describe Thundercat? He's a progressive bass player who is, um, he writes a lot of real weird, trippy, prog jazz music. Uh, he's actually he's he's known for producing some of Kendrick Lamar's stuff in recent years. So some of the um, some of his award winning hip hop tracks that have more of like a jazz style in the instrumentation are resp- uh, That's Thundercat who's responsible for some of that arranging. Um, he's also just like. I I love his bass playing. Like when you see him live in a small club, I mean, it is like you, you know that visceral feeling that the first person who said like that a concert melted their face off. Like you, you know where that feeling came from that the person who first said that had like just the, uh, the virtuoso that he is on bass mixed with um, just how like purely loud (laughs) his music is uh is just it's just very aggressive but also very quirky and weird and thoughtful and uh his new record dropped sometime in the past week and it's got all sorts of fun collaborations it's got lewis cole from the prog dubstepy kind of electronica group called knower uh it's got a couple of hip-hop artists it's got donald glover on one track uh it's just very very good i guess you could call it like neo soul but with a kind of a progressive jazz twist to it uh, there's really no way to describe thundercat if you've never heard him he's he's exceptional so that's uh his, his new album is called it is what it is see i can't give you an album i can just give you a couple of songs really to go to go listen to um one would be and neither one of these is really that new one would be to go and listen to the jive aces they have a song called bring me sunshine there's also a video about it, but it takes an old Louis Prima tune and uh, combines it with a swing band and ukulele. The Jive Aces were on like the UK's Got Talent or something like that a few years ago. And just if people haven't experienced it, it's kind of fun. And then the other one that's worth listening is Billie Eilish for the Golden Globes or something did a version of Yesterday that was just quite wonderful. Now, nothing will ever match the Beatles. But it's definitely worth a listen to. So look up Yesterday by Billie Eilish on YouTube. And those are definitely both worth listening to. So my album that I have enjoyed the most lately is called You and I. And it's from Wycliffe Gordon and Marty Erickson, both of which I was introduced to at the Brass Band of Battle Creek. And of course, Wycliffe Gordon has been around amazing trombonist vocalist and you know he's won like the trombone jazz award before and marty marty erickson is a professor up in uh, wisconsin at one of the university of wisconsin schools over there their collaboration it's just a lot of fun it's nice seeing two professional guys like that tuba and trombone my my little brass people there awesome all right moving on to app of the week um for me, since the learning is switching to an online model, a lot of the documents that I like to make are in the iWork suite. And those are things like my sectional schedule, my daily agenda that goes up on the screen as a keynote file, spreadsheets for managing money, uh, making seating charts, not in iWork, but in OmniGraffle by the Omni Group. Think things that don't exist right now in band, the documents that we don't need. Whereas there's kind of the shift to web-based stuff. So I'm actually using the, the Google apps 
a lot more in the past week, uh, kind of just by necessity, not because I want to. Um, so my app of the week is actually not anything Google. It's Slack, which is a team communication application that my te- my music team uses. And what's really handy about Slack is it's kind of like somewhere between email and a text message, but for teams, uh, you have different channels where different topics happen. So like we have a top, a whole channel where all the discussion for e-learning is like housed under that conversation thread. But then we're all playing Animal Crossing right now. So like the conversation about whose island is selling turnips for the cheapest price is not clogging up the professional conversation. It's in its own channel. But then it's got real great support for things like the Google Docs we're working with because you can plug third-party web apps into your Slack channel. So like um, we've got a Google Docs integration where if I share a link to a Google Doc with a certain channel and the people who are subscribed to that channel on my music team, like if I forgot to share the Google Doc with them, it'll actually, a little bot will show up and say, hey, these two people in this channel, you didn't share this with them. Do you want me to go ahead and share it with them? And then you just click yes right from within the little bot. So it's an awesome app for communicating via text for doing document collaboration and it has made the past week a lot more productive but also a lot more sane because we're having these e-meetings and we're like having our side chat in the slack at the same time as the e-meeting like uh (laughs) can you believe this (laughs) there's a couple of us that are using zoom in our in our school meetings and one of the things i love about is i go on my phone because my computer's uh, school computer is old enough that i can't do it and I put a different background in every meeting. So like I'll be in the jungle or I'll be in a dungeon. And it's just, it's fun to distract the meetings that way too. It's kind of fun. I know what you're talking about, side conversation. Disney put out some of those um, backgrounds that I've used. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to go check those out, Paul. <laughs> so is that your app of the week is Zoom, Chris? No, no. <laughs> Please, I, I, unfortunately, a good percentage no of way. those, basically two weeks we had to plan were spent in all-day online meetings. I was telling you guys about that over, uh, I think we were iMessaging back and forth, and there were days that I spent four hours on online meetings with people, um, you know, where you're just sitting as a member. So, um, but no, so I would not do that. But I, my life would not be possible right now if it were not for LumaFusion. I know that's not a new app by any means, the imagination, but LumaFusion allows me to make the videos along with the overlays of like chords or lyrics that I need to make. And I couldn't do it in iMovie. I'd have to have something even more powerful and it's all done on my iPad. So the combination of that and iCab mobile for when I need to uh, borrow a video from YouTube and insert it into a larger movie um, is just really a win for me. They just came out with a new feature that will allow you to import or I guess export a project to Final Cut Pro on a Mac. Yes, you're talking LumaFusion? Yeah. LumaFusion did? Yeah. I finally um, I finally bought that app within the past couple of months, I think, when they announced that feature because I wanted to give it a test spin. Do you have any video resource recommendations for someone who wants to learn the basics? You mean like tutorials or anything? Yeah, like where, where do you go when you want to learn how to do something? I, do you want – the truth is – there's very little that I feel like I need to learn, but I follow LumaFusion on Twitter and occasionally they post like a tutorial video that somebody else has made. And that's where I learn about things like I, I don't have much need for it very often, but like keyframes, which is kind of a neat way to do, you know, like graphics and so forth on on your video in a kind of a low budget mode sort of deal. They That's where I find tutorials for that stuff. Um, so my app has got to be Cubasis 3. I've just upgraded from Cubasis 2, and Cubasis 3 is is a nice upgrade. And being able to do all that digital audio recording stuff on my iPad, it just kind of blows my mind that it's just possible. All the stuff that I had to have a desktop computer for in the past, I don't have to have that. And- yeah. Wow. Lots of iPad stuff. Two, two shining examples of actual professional iPad software. Well, throw that pad in there. There you go. There's three. <laughs> I mean, this is pro-level stuff. You know, and people keep on going, well, where's Logic Pro for iPad? And, you know, it's not from Apple, but Cubasis 3 is there, man. 
I, you know, you're not missing a whole lot. I would just love to not have to do a whole lot of exporting and importing. I would just, I think it would be cool to be able to save my work on the Mac somewhere and then throw my iPad in my bag and pick up where I left off. Cause I don't, I'm not doing projects like that. I'm, you know, this podcast, I mean, I understand it's tough to sync tons of audio and video resources over the cloud, but like our three audio files that we're going to share with each other aren't going to really take up that much space in a logic project. Right. And you hit the nail on the head there when you said, I don't want to be able to, I don't, I don't want to have to whisk things back and forth and exporting and importing. And Notion does that so well. I can pick up a file on my iPad in Notion and work on it and then close it and later come back to my desktop and it's the same document on my desktop. And I don't think about exporting and saving it and emailing it and all the other stuff. Um, so that integration would be <laughs> profound. Right on. All right, well, that's everything I had in the plan. Do you all have anything else you wanted to say or talk about? I'm good. It's been wonderful. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you all enjoy your afternoons. All right. I'll talk to you. Bye. Bye. All right. <laughs> See you all. Bye. Have a good one. See you later, Paul. <laughs>